الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم one of the uh, very essential aspects that uh, a believer has to keep in mind when they make an effort to advance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the whole concept of having a schedule now actually this doesn't only apply to matters of the quote unquote dunya i'm sorry quote unquote deen but it actually also applies to the dunya as well if you look at people who succeed in whatever they attempt to do often they'll have a schedule so go to the life go follow around any ceo of any company and you'll see that they spend a lot of time developing a schedule um they follow that schedule their secretaries print out for them every day this is your schedule and they use that as a way of guiding themselves along the day so that they can be as productive as possible there's a red car blocking five cars outside in the parking lot okay there's a red car and that red car is blocking five other cars so if you can please move it whether it be a sister's car or a brother's car anyway you'll find that those people who achieve their goals in life often they have a schedule that sched- that goal can be either a goal of advancing themselves in the de- in the dunya or it can be a goal of advancing themselves in the deen but usually one of the common threads of people who succeed in whatever they attempt to achieve is that they have a schedule now this actually was present also in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam So if you analyze the life of the Prophet alayhi salam you'll find that there are some basic principles that were present within his life that drove his schedule. Actually inherently the deen creates a schedule for us because we have five prayers those five prayers force us to wake at it, wake up at a certain time usually force us to go to sleep at a certain time they provide for various interactions based on the amount of time that exists between each of the prayers. But really the five prayers is our default schedule. and then those five prayers can also be used to determine how we spend our time in between the five prayers as well ramadan is the same way so in ramadan we all went on to a very positive schedule so we woke up early we ate our meals after we completed our meals we spent some time in ibadah we tried to get to the masjid we then went to work we spent most of the day working and then eventually we come home either we take a nap or if we if it's close to iftar we would eat iftar and then we would keep going all the way until the evening we'd be running to the, running off to the masjid so our schedules were very very set during that time the issue is once you leave the month of ramadan in fact you can even just begin to think we say ramadan it doesn't even feel like we passed just passed ramadan it's such a far memory the issue becomes when we leave the month of ramadan how we should develop our schedules so i just want to touch upon that a bit because it's one of the most common questions that people send as as an as an email they say that i'm trying to establish myself i'm trying to establish the habits of developing myself but my problem is is that i don't have a good schedule so i just wanted to touch on some of the, some of the very very key points and you've heard them before but the reminder benefits me it benefits you as well first and foremost is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go to bed early in the evening early in the evening basically means that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would pray the isha prayer and then he would sub- subsequently go to sleep Now actually it was the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to pray the Isha prayer after the first one third of the night. So you hear these various hadith where the night is divided. For example, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained to us that waking up in the last one third of the night was extremely beneficial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowers himself in a particular manner and asks who is there who is asking for my nearness etc. who is asking for my forgiveness and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua of those people at that time. That's in the last one third of the night. When you see these divisions what those divisions actually are marking is from maghrib until the beginning of fajr. So let's say that maghrib starts at 8 o'clock, right? And the beginning of fajr is at the next day, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning. So all that period of time constitutes um what 10 hours. So in those 10 hours you divide that by 3 and 
the first one third is you know three hours and twenty twenty minutes. The next one third is the next three hours and twenty minutes, and the last one third is the next three hours and twenty minutes. So the Prophet ﷺ's habit was that once the that he would pray the Isha prayer after the first third of the night. That's when he would like to have the Isha prayer. Actually, what's interesting is if you go through Hadith and you look at the way the Sahaba prayed the Isha prayer, they were very tired at that time. They were very, very tired at that time. It even comes in narration that they would literally be falling asleep waiting for the Prophet to come to the masjid. But that was his general habit to pray at that time. It actually highlights another very important principle about schedules. Often people ask about sleep. They say, how many hours should I sleep? How Should I be sleeping six hours? Should I be sleeping eight hours? Should I be sleeping ten hours? And one of the principles that my teacher used to teach me from hadith was that actually you don't determine when to go to sleep. Sleep should tell you when you need to go to sleep. Meaning you should be so tired, so tired, so tired that it's time for you to sleep. You, your body's telling you it's time to sleep. Rather than you kind of look at the clock and say it's 9 o'clock, now 9 o'clock is my time to sleep. You just go to sleep whether you're tired or whether you're not tired. So that was one of his principles and I watched him do this throughout the time that I've spent with him. But regard, irrespective, the Prophet ﷺ would pray the Isha prayer after the first third of the night. After the first third of the night, the Isha prayer would be prayed in Jama'ah. After the Isha prayer was prayed in Jama'ah, the Prophet ﷺ would not interact with people. In fact, he encouraged people to not speak after the Isha prayer, and he encouraged people to go to bed after the Isha prayer. Now, the debate among the ulama actually begins, or the discussion then arises, should you even speak to your wife, or should a wife even speak to a husband after the Isha prayer, given the way the Prophet ﷺ has been so strict about this issue? And then they basically resolve, based on other ahadith, that the Prophet ﷺ and, uh, he, the Prophet ﷺ would speak to his spouses, and his spouses would speak to him after the Isha prayer, but he would not interact with most other people. Now, what happens actually is after the Isha prayer becomes a very, very dark time. It almost be, I don't know how to explain this in another way. It sounds sort of magical and mystical and I don't, I don't want it to sound like that. But there is sort of this darkness that encompasses the earth at that time or you are part of the earth at that time. What's very interesting is I can even explain this to you in a dunya perspective, just telling, just as a practical matter. So this month I happen to be doing a rotation at the medical examiner's office. Right? The medical examiner's is the name of a place where all of the people who die either a mysterious death or, or a shooting or a killing or these types of deaths, they all go to the medical, medical examiner's office. Literally that place, every time I walk in that place, it smells of death. And it is, I, just, I walk in there and I tell the other residents, this place is the house of doom. There's a, probably a refrigerator as big as this whole masjid. So you're talking about this room, the room behind, and the other sister's area. Now in that place, in that refrigerator, are all dead bodies. And every day, new dead bodies fill that refrigerator, and the other ones are taken out. Okay, that You can just think about how many people come in. And now these are people that are gunshot wounds. These are people that were stabbed. These were people that were killed. These were people that were in car accidents. Small children, they drown or something like that. All of these bodies come to the medical examiners. Usually the ones that, then the police have detectives, they also come over there. So I was sitting there one day, and there was this very young, healthy individual. And he had, it was, he was driving, it was probably like two or three in the morning. And as he was crossing over the median of the highway, he hit the divider, and he passed away instantaneously. Now this is just one, I mean every day there's probably, we have ten, ten benches, and each bench runs three or four bodies. That was just one body. Then every single day, the same theme was there. This guy was out at 2 in the morning. This person was out at 1 in the morning. These people were driving around at late at, late at night. And so when I didn't say anything. I'm just thinking in my own mind, subhanAllah, the Prophet in one hadith told us that if you knew what happened when it gets dark outside, you would not leave your homes. If you knew the reality of the earth at the time when it becomes dark outside, you would never leave your homes. There's a hadith of that nature. I'm not quoting it exactly, but that's the rough translation of it. Now, actually, then I started thinking in my own mind that, subhanAllah, I look at all these deaths that are occurring, and it, they're just so they're so amazing the way these deaths are, are, are occurring, and they all sort of fit under that hadith of these people going out late at night and not and being someplace they shouldn't be, whether it be a shooting or a stabbing or a rape or a drowning or a car accident. There was such a general theme tying together many of those deaths. So one day I was sitting there, and another body came in, and one of the medical examiners was examining that body. They were going through it. They were figuring out what the cause of death was. And then all of a sudden, the physician examining the body said, and that's why we always say here at the medical examiner's office, 
nothing good ever happens after midnight. I said, subhanAllah, that's actually hadith. Nothing good ever happens after midnight. Meaning, what, she, what the examiner was saying was that when you examine these bodies and you see the cause of death and you see the common thread that ties together so many of these deaths, so many of them occur at midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, when a time, a time when people shouldn't be out, that they themselves came up with the conclusion. They're not even looking at revelation. I'm telling you from wahi, from revelation, from hadith, they themselves, through their own natural experience of watching the world the way it works, they themselves came up with the conclusion that nothing good ever happens at midnight. Meaning you shouldn't be out after midnight. There's no reason to be. If you're out after midnight, you're putting yourself at risk. So subhanAllah, what they were able to ascertain from their observation of the dunya, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us 1400 years ago from his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really, when these advices exist, you begin to understand the truth of them when you begin to understand the reality of the world. Now, for you people, most of you don't don't get to experience that type of situation, so you don't really see the world that way. We tend to judge the world the way we experience it, right? We think everybody eats. We think everybody goes to college. We think everybody is trying to decide what home they want to buy. Because those are the challenges that face many people, many people here. But actually, 99% of the world does not work that way. There's many, many people, the vast majority of the world are fighting for their next meal. right? But that's not the way we look at the world because that's not how our surroundings are. We think basically the whole place is Muslim, right? There's so many Muslims all over the place because we always see Muslims all the time. So we always tend to create our judgments based on our surroundings. But were you to go out and explore, you would see that the statements of the Prophet ﷺ are true in any realm. In any realm, wherever you place yourself. So the Prophet ﷺ statement that you, you, once mid, once Isha prayer is prayed, it's a t- it's no longer a time to be going out. It's no longer a time to be hanging out. It's no longer a time to be fooling around, etc. The Prophet ﷺ statement of going to Isha covers all of those things. Going to bed after Isha covers all of those things. So one very very important principle is that after Isha, there's very little barakah in your time. That's the other way to look at the Sunnah of the Prophet. He's telling you when there's barakah and when there's no barakah. After Isha, there is very little barakah in time. Now what we tend to do is we tend to make that our time of going out with our friends. That's when we go out to eat. That's when we try to study. That's when we try to get work done. But actually there is very little barakah in that time. If there was barakah in that time, the Prophet ﷺ would never have slept at that time. He would have stayed awake and used that time for other acts. Now then the Prophet ﷺ would actually wake up very early in the morning. So he would go to bed early and then he would wake up early. Much before the Fajr prayer. And that time is a very, very blessed time for the person who seeks nearness to Allah. That's a time of prayer. That's a time of dhikr. That's a time of recitation of the Qur'an, etc. And the reason being is because that is a time when Allah Himself draws near to the earth. As the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in the hadith that I mentioned at the very beginning when we first started this discussion. So waking up early is very important. Now, those people who wake up early, whether you define that as waking up for Fajr prayer or whether you define that as waking up before the Fajr prayer, one of the habits that we have is as soon as we pray the Fajr prayer, we jump back in bed. But actually, that morning time is the most blessed time for getting work done. And subhanAllah, that's also present within just the common culture as well. People always say what? The early bird catches the worm, right? This is one of the statements that's present within our society, present within our culture. It's based on the experience of people. What they're saying is that when you wake up early and you start your work early, you're going to be successful. That's the one who gets the result, yani catches the worm. So the, the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ mimics that exactly. The Prophet ﷺ would wake up early, pray the Fajr prayer, and as soon as he would pray the Fajr prayer, he would spend the rest of that time then beginning the deeds of the day. Whether it was visiting the sick, going to the market, taking care of the home, whatever the issues were, the Prophet ﷺ would do it at that time. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-subhatu tamna'ur risk. Sleeping after the Fajr prayer prohibits risk. It blocks your risk. Okay? Now, in this particular case, what's the Prophet ﷺ highlighting is that at that time your risk is coming. Now, whether you be a student and you're seeking your risk is knowledge, or whether you be a person who's working and your risk is your paycheck, whatever it be, sleeping after the Fajr prayer prohibits that risk. So the Prophet ﷺ here is also providing a very simple principle for that those people that aim to succeed and make their lives productive, that's the time to be working, not the time to be sleeping. So look at the paradigm. The paradigm is to sleep early and wake up early. Instead, we often sleep late and wake up late. Right? 
And so actually we miss out on those windows when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually sh- sending His barakah in our deeds. So very, very important for people who are trying to do so much, like yourselves, where you're trying to memorize Quran, you're trying to learn, you're trying to study, and you're trying to balance your lives, quote-unquote, in the dunya. It's very important that you keep in mind these principles. Then the Prophet ﷺ would continue his work throughout the day all the way until the Dhuhr prayer. Depending on the season, whether it was winter or whether it was uh, summer, the Prophet ﷺ would either, either take a nap before the Dhuhr prayer or after the Dhuhr prayer. But he would take a nap during the afternoon. Now, when you think about that nap after the after, when you talk about that nap that was taken in the afternoon, you have to understand that what that refers to is a 10 or 15 minute nap. Now, the people who understand this are the CEOs and the executives of companies in this day and age, and the big ulama. Those are the two people in the world who understand what this nap means. The big ulama do it because they do it because it's sunnah, and they've made their whole life subservient to the sunnah. And in their lives, it's productivity. SubhanAllah, you look at the effort of our scholars, you look at the books that they wrote, you look what they were able to do, it's amazing. And all of it was based on their schedule. They worked at times of barakah, they slept at times when you're supposed to sleep, which brought barakah into their sleep, and that's how they were able to achieve what they achieved. The only people in the history of the world that have achieved what our scholars have achieved are the CEOs. Right? Just as we spread the deen from place to place to place, opening, opening up new branches, right? We, these, we open up branches and these companies open branches. We open branches, they're called masajid. Our corporate headquarters is in the Kaaba. Right? That's where everything started. And we have our little branches that open up throughout the world. We call those masajid. So we have a job. We're, we have the same business running in the world just like whatever Walmart has. Right? Walmart has a corporate headquarter. They open stores. We have a corporate headquarter. We open masajid. All right? So in the same way, they also open their corporate headquarters and they have a very similar schedule. And they'll tell you, what did they do? This They, they call this the power now. Right around lunchtime, they take 15 minutes. Whether it be lying down in their chair, whether it be lying down in some other setup that they have, they take 15 minutes. One day when I was a second year medical student, we had the world's expert on sleep come and give a lecture to us in our physiology class. (laughs) World's expert on sleep. Actually, I went there just to see what he would say because at that time I was particularly interested in medicine and the sunnah. So he was the world's expert on sleep and he started talking about when you should sleep and when you shouldn't sleep. So... I looked, I listened to the whole lecture and it was very interesting the way he was saying things basically completely in accordance with the sunnah. But what was interesting is the way he proved all of this. So how did he prove this? He said that actually human beings have a natural drive to sleep at two times. Number one, at lunchtime, either before or after. And number two, at about midnight, which is sort of like the one third of the night. So he said the way you prove this is you look at the amount of car accidents that occur throughout the day due to sleep due to people falling asleep behind the wheel. Because here you have someone concentrating on an, on an act, and it's a very involved act, and then all of a sudden they're sleeping despite their concentration. So he showed this graph. And on that graph he had, okay, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Now, subhanAllah, the car accidents that occur for people falling asleep behind the wheel, they don't max, they're not maximum at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. when you would think people must be dead tired at this time. Actually, they're maximum at midnight. There's some big drive to sleep at about midnight, and then it, it curves up, it comes back down, and then it's baseline, 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 all the way till you hit about noon. And at noon, again, there's a big peak. And then all of a sudden, it's baseline. So these two times where there's peaks are the exact two times that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged sleeping. Meaning there's actually, it's actually na- human nature to desire to sleep at that time. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ schedule would continue all the way. He would take a short nap of Dhuhr prayer. When he took that nap of Dhuhr prayer, what would happen is he would be totally refreshed. Now look, the Prophet ﷺ begins his day at what? 2, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., stays up all the way until noon, a full eight-hour day has already occurred. Right? If you begin at 4 a.m. and you go all the way until noon, you basically worked eight hours. You, a full eight-hour day has already occurred. Then what happens? The Prophet ﷺ would take a nap. That 15-minute nap was so powerful that it wakes, you wake up, you refresh yourself completely. Now what do you do? You begin a whole new day. So at 1 o'clock, you are now beginning a whole new day. You stay awake until about 9 or 10 o'clock. That's another 8 hours, roughly. So now basically what happens is your one day became like two days. Your one day became like two days. Rather than having an 8-hour day, you had two 8-hour days in that time span. And both of them, you were fully energetic because you had the nap at the proper time. So this was actually the way that we used to study as well. I didn't 
make up the schedule. I learned the schedule. I used to live the schedule. When we were studying in Pakistan, we lived according to the schedule. They were so, uh, if the schedule was so effective that those students would do in one year what I would see medical students do in two or three. Now those were medical students, mind you. Some of the brightest people in the country and they were working hard, they just, they were, they were mature, etc. Yet, I would not see medical students achieve what these students would achieve in a one to two year period. They would walk in the very first day, they would not know anything. Within the end of the year, they would be reading texts in Arabic. Reading texts in Arabic in one year. Classical texts, not the, you know, the simple texts. Classical Arabic texts in one year. And then I would ask myself the question, subhanAllah, how can this be? How can it be that all these, all my friends in the university setting who are so smart, so educated, so intelligent, they're trying to study Arabic and they have not been, they keep failing, they start and stop, start and stop, start and stop and nothing occurs. Years and years go by and they keep saying the same thing, I'm studying Arabic and nothing happens. And then all of a sudden these students who are quote unquote the illiterate, alright, of their, of their place, all of a sudden within one year they're able to read Arabic fluently. That's because they lived according to this schedule. They took advantage of the schedule and they were able to achieve tremendous amounts in a short period of time. They were doing so because they saw, saw their teachers do so. Their teachers did so because they saw their teachers did so. Their teachers did so because they saw the Sahaba doing so. The Sahaba did so because they saw the Prophet and them doing so. So actually all of this is a silsila. You know, when you talk about the transmission of the deen, there's many ways by which it's transmitted. One way in which the deen is transmitted is by word. So I tell you that the Prophet ﷺ said, and I heard from my teachers that the Prophet ﷺ said, and that's a chain that goes all the way back and it comes to you. Another way is by actually action. I watched my teacher did something, he saw his teacher did something, etc. all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. So there's two ways by which this, this tradition is transmitted. One is word and one is the other is action. So this is an action that I actually watched transmitted. I saw all these students living according to this schedule. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ would then continue his day between the Asr and Maghrib prayer, that time was for generally for eating or for family or that type of those types of matters. And then finally, the Prophet ﷺ would reach the Maghrib prayer. From Maghrib to Isha was a was a time that was generally spent in ibadah. And in fact, if you go into Mecca and Medina today, you find the same thing. There's a lot of energy in the masjid from Maghrib to Isha. Everybody sits in the masjid at that time. Nobody gets up. From, they pray Maghrib. They sit there. They either have their hal- halakas. Or they start reading Quran, but you just feel this energy at that time. There's just, I, if you've been there, you'll know what I'm describing. From Maghrib until Isha, there is some kind of energy in the masjid. Whichever masjid, whether it be Mecca or Medina, it's the same thing. You even feel like sitting, right? No matter what, you just feel like staying. You feel like there's a lot of light. You feel like there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of blessing. And that's because that time actually is very blessed. And it's a very, very good time to use for your own personal Islamic development. Whether it be recitation of the Quran, whether it be being in the masjid, whether it be your studies of knowledge, your memorization of Quran, adhkar, etc. So that's a very, very powerful time to take advantage of the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in being able to achieve what you hope to achieve. Anyway, the reason for this discussion was several fold, but the key was that several emails came across over the last few days where people had questions about their schedule. Now, Remember one thing is that the bare, the actual foundation of the whole schedule is the five prayers. Right? And that's also very interesting because when you try to establish a schedule, it's not very easy to establish. If I just say this should be your schedule, it's not going to happen. But the five prayers are always there. You know you're going to pray Fajr, you know you're going to pray Luhr, you know you're going to pray Asr, Maghrib and Isha. So now what you have to do is you have to take those five prayers, put them in their place. Once you put them into their place, then you build everything around them. So that's the beauty of our deen. See, if you randomly say, every day you should do dhikr, no one's going to be able to do it. But when you advise someone, every day you should do dhikr, and the time you should do it is right after Maghrib prayer, it becomes much easier. Because Maghrib prayer is a set post in your life. It's already nailed into the ground. So to attach something to that post is very easy. But to randomly try to post something into your life is not. So what you should do is take your prayers and establish this schedule that I've just went, just gone through, but take your prayers and establish them against those prayers. So think, okay, from Maghrib to Isha, I'm going to do this. After Isha, I'm going to do this. After Fajr, I'm going to stay up, etc. And so, inshallah, what you'll see is that over time, when you begin to inculcate this schedule, you'll find that there is a tremendous productivity in your life, whether it be for your, not, your studies in university or high school or beyond, 
or whether it be the Adhkar, the Quran, etc., that you spend your time in an effort of, of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be regular in our schedules, to be regular in our prayers so that we can use them as a post for our schedules and to be able to inculcate the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it comes to our schedule. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ